Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm Maurice. I'm an alcoholic. I'm Maurice. By the grace of a kind and loving God, and because this program works, I'm sober tonight and have been since August 18th, 1972. And I love that countdown. I love to see Marguerite and Clancy and Mildred. And, you know, y'all, y'all were here when I got here. And there's a lot of people that uh, are new here. And I uh, hope I don't run you off. You know, I'm the kickoff or the warm-up speaker or whatever you want to call me. Uh, didn't want to get emotional until we start off with Amazing Grace. And, man, I, you know, that kind of stuff does a number on me. I can't think of a, a better way to start the meeting. And the young lady that sang, I think she's said a little earlier, she's getting married in November. And Larry, he celebrated his, uh, I believe, two years. And that's the Friday date, 9999. My sponsor was 6666. Wow. Marshall. Uh, I don't know. I, I guess he can keep up with the one like that. But anyway, I, it's a, it's an honor and a privilege to be a member of the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous and be here, uh, tonight. Uh, it is especially, uh, this is a special town for me. Uh, as was Texarkana. I came in to Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, August the 18th in Beaumont, Texas. I'd been exposed prior to that down in, uh, Shreveport, Louisiana at the Highland Club. Uh, but I had to liven up my drunk log. From 68 to 72, I needed to go get some more DWIs and cause a lot more hell and misery and, and all of that kind of stuff that we do. I was talking to Kevin back there a little earlier. I hadn't seen Kevin since about 87 and, and we got to talking about it takes what it takes. You know, do I know what it takes to come to Alcoholics Anonymous? No. It just takes what it takes. And, uh, my day of grace was, was, was that day. And, uh, uh, it was a surrender day. You know, I was, I was knocked down by my own actions. And, uh, I was willing. I was teachable. My ego had been deflated. And, uh, I am an ego maniac, you know, with an inferiority complex. Uh, I probably made a fabulous talk on the plane from Fairbanks to, to Dallas to Atlanta, Texas, and then up to Mena and here, uh, as, as we can do in our mind. But, uh, I'm not a, a speaker. Uh, I, I don't claim to be. Uh, I am, uh, privileged and honored to be here. You know, uh, I could tell you about all the bad times I had as a young person in Atlanta, Texas, which is my hometown. I think there's some Texans here tonight. As a matter of fact, James, I think, is from uh, Big Sandy. I think he claims Slidell, Louisiana. But anyway, he may have a little Texan in him, too. But we're just scattered everywhere. But you can't go to Alaska and act like a big shot. I left there uh, about ten days ago. I, I told them I was from Texas, and they looked at me, yeah. <laughs> the hell of a deal, eh? <laughs> But I'm, I'm proud of that, you know. I really, I really am. I, I'm, I'm proud of that, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm grateful to be here. The, the fact of the matter is, when I come to El Dorado in 1973, uh, the this this city and this state was a land of opportunity for me, and uh, I'll never be uh, able to express my gratitude. I was uh, a guest in the uh, Jean's house last night, you know. Uh, Bless her heart. She's got 42 years. She celebrated that last night uh, along with Larry. And, uh, uh, you know, to be able to share that and, uh, uh, it is special. It's, it's not, it's not a little deal. It's a real big deal for somebody to share you, share their life. Uh, and I, I learned how to live here, uh, in, in this, uh, town, but with you people. And, uh, uh, I, I'm so grateful to see Kelly. You know, Kelly's been around a long time. Matter of fact, he's going to be up Beaver's Bend. He's going to be a speaker up there in a couple of weeks. And, uh, you know, if we, we're either a part of the problem or a part of the solution, and I, uh, the most of y'all that I continue to see over and over and over, I feel like you're probably a part of the solution. But I used to early on blame a lot of my, uh, problems on my mother and daddy, and the fact of the matter is, I was their problem. They were, they were not my problem. Uh, I was their problem when I took the family's uh, car keys when I was 13 years old. My mother said I couldn't have the car. It was a black market 49 Ford, maroon. There was a, lots of them. 
And I managed to te- destroy it in about 30 minutes. I took my sister to school and dropped her off. And then I took off and uh, there was a guy with a cast on his leg that pulled out from in front of a uh, GI school uh, there in Atlanta. And uh, he missed a, missed a gear and stopped in the road and it was mist and rain and I'm facing the school bus and him and I run up under it the only thing that's left is a stupid look and a, and a steering wheel and that was 13 years old I mean and I walked up to tell my daddy and it, man he was a razor strop butt whooper now, he, he, he didn't know how to show a lot of mercy but he didn't whip me that day and I think he, I think he knew if he had of it to kill me but I spread a lot of crap as, as a youngster uh, my mom and daddy uh my daddy was a one-eyed automobile mechanic that was 36 years old when I was born, and I always thought he was old-fashioned and didn't understand. And my mother, bless her heart, uh, my daddy was one of 13 kids. You know, uh, he, he had a rough go, to. But my mother went to the third grade, and she quit school, and she got married young, and on and on and on. But uh, I always uh, complained about my dilemma. The fact of the matter is I went to church camp as a little boy, and I went to Boy Scout camp. Camp Pioneer in Mena, Arkansas as a little boy. And I run away from home when I was 15. I enjoyed all of them I could stand. I, I had no discipline in my life. I have, <laughs> I have very little in it probably right now, but I guess I'm, I'm in a deal where it works okay. You know, like my wife's at work today. I, well, let's see. It's 4.30 in Fairbanks, Alaska. Yeah, she's working, and as long as somebody in the household's got to work, it might as well be her. <laughs> Point is, I retired out of the military in 95, and there's a few years difference between our age, and, and that's the reason. It isn't because I'm that intelligent. I couldn't have worked that deal out if I'd have tried. But uh, my point is, I am my biggest problem. Life and you are not my problem. We can have a conversation. It's not what you say, it's what I hear. I can distort it. I can screw it up big time from the time you say it to the time I hear it that quick. And that's my deal. It's a messed up deal. I didn't know that for a long time. I I became teachable finally, you know, uh, in 1972. And a day at a time, I'm willing to be wrong. I don't necessarily say I promptly admit it. As it says that we should do, but in a, in time I will. <laughs> you know, I'll finally admit that I might have made a mistake. But uh, I, I couldn't wait to get away from that deal as, as a young man at home. And I graduated from high school on a on a Friday night, and I was a resident of Dallas uh, Saturday morning, and I was drunk, and I had a little darling Saturday night, and it just went on like that. From June of 1954 until June of 1955, I had eight jobs. They just didn't appreciate me. (laughs) You know, I just had to keep checking around. And then I went past that Air Force recruiter's sign down on Commerce Street in Dallas, Main Street maybe. And uh, they told me what I wanted to hear. And being a Texan, I wanted to see the world. But I, I go off to Lackland Air Force Base, and then uh, after that, everybody's going off to the world, and I go across town to Fort Sam Houston. Got a dollar and thirty-two cents travel pay, <laughs> and my jaws was tight. I am, I am raising some cane in my sick mind. Now, my first time to get drunk was in uh, Shreveport, State Fair, of Louisiana. Fifteen years old. Uh. I stepped out of my shoes that night on Highway 59 at my mother's place, which I'm still there some of the time. But I step out of a loafer on 59 and one at the back door, a shirt in the hall, a shirt, a pair of pants somewhere else, peed in the bed, threw up on the floor, got my butt whooped the next morning. That was the first time I took a drink. Now, a lot of people don't have to do that ever again. Never have to do it again. You don't have to. You don't have to wake up feeling like I did or like a lot of us have for for a lot of times. But that was my first drink. Well, for really for about three years, I didn't drink for, you know, for any, uh, or didn't drink any significant amount. But uh, that deal at Fort Sam Houston and then after a few weeks of that, I go off to my first duty station, which is Walter's Army Air Force Base. 
out of Mineral Wells, Texas, and my first day at work, I, this little story just seems to come out. Anyway, my my first day at work, I was at, at a little hospital ward that might have been as big as from this first chair over the wall back to here. It was either a four-bed or six-bed hospital with a young, red-headed second lieutenant in charge, airman third-class tabler, and one patient in the bed. And we were all real nervous. We're new, on, new in the Air Force, and this old boy laying up in the bed. But anyway, my point is, I wasn't that jet pilot and that John Wayne deal that I didn't have enough sense to be anyway. But, but when I went in, I had visions of grandeur, and it just didn't happen. But my first day at work, the nurse said, we've got to give him an enema. <laughs> She's a lieutenant, I'm airman third, and this poor dude's laying up in the bed paralyzed with fear. Because you know I emulated comfort and peace and caring attitude. And I walked up and uh, I knew what to do. I went to the utility room and I got the little bucket and I got the rope and tube and KY jelly and all that stuff. And the IV stand, I had it to proper height and the proper temperature. Told him pull his knee to his chest and relax. <laughs> you know, he's laying on his side. All that was fine. Pull your knee to your chest and relax. And I'm sure I was shaking all over from being mad, irritated. And anyway, when I hit the spigot and shot the juice to him, he said, man, his eyes rolled. And he said, I can't hold it. And he did a brown out on me. <laughs> from here down, I had on a white smock. White pants, spit shine shoes, GI haircut, and he dethroned. He just, my mind was warped to start with, all right? That was my first day, and I knew I had three years and, and nine more months of that. If you think that won't play hell with a sick mind, there ain't a cow in Texas. So it, it got worse from there. I, I knew uh, my daughter happens to be here. I don't think she's ever heard me talk, and that's probably good. And, and after the meeting, if she can probably tell you how much of this is a lie and how much of it is true. Bless her heart, uh, she drove down here from Atlanta tonight after getting off work, and I appreciate that, and I love her. But uh, <clears throat> her mother uh, was in uh, in Dallas, and I drove. This is This is the way I believe this. It may not have happened like that. Bless her heart, she passed away earlier this year, had a brain tumor. But I had a chance to, to uh, ask her to forgive me for being who and what I am, uh, I believe, last year. And she, I think she did. But anyway, I went over that night, and uh, as I recall, she asked me to marry her. That might not have happened like that. I'd rather think that she did. <laughs> And it, again, uh, I guess she'll forgive me if I'm lying about it. But anyway, I wanted some of that wonderful stuff, and you know what I'm talking about. And I was willing to go to any length to get it, and that seemed to be the quickest way, and I said, okay. And we go off to Oklahoma, and we did, and uh, after about two weeks, I think we both knew damn well that was not good. That was not a good deal. Uh, it got worse. And uh, I was in the Air Force, like I said, and I volunteered to go fight the wars. There's no wars going on except in Mineral Wells, Texas, with my wife and I. But I did. I got orders for uh, Korea, and I wound up in Japan, 18 months in in, uh, in Japan instead of going on to Korea. And all I did for 18 months was stay drunk and party. I mean, you know, I worked 11 to 7. I would come in drunk. The nurses would help me pass out mid midnight medications, and then I would pass out. And I did it for 18 months. When I come back to the States, I had a son a year old. Never seen it. Wasn't father material. Wasn't husband material. Wasn't any of that. I was a dyed-in-the-wool alcoholic. And to adapt and to adjust back <laughs> into life in the in the world, as, as my man Roger said over here last night, the Vietnam veteran made a great talk last night. I appreciated you saying that. Uh, uh, I just, I just wasn't ready. I was irresponsible, and I, I was incapable of love, and on and on and on and on. You know, not that that's unique to me alone, because a lot of us uh, that I've talked to have felt some of the same things. But anyway, it seemed like all we would do is fight. I knew Judge Sarah T. Hughes. She swore in 
President Johnson when, when President Kennedy was assassinated, but she knew me on a first name basis from showing up in her court. And uh, uh, another fellow, I don't know why I forgot his name, he's called the Law West of the Trinity. He knew me. I, he'd see me in the grocery store and he said, When are you going to come see me? <laughs> I thought, You got a hell of a sick sense of humor, you old, you know what? And man, it wouldn't be a week, I'd be there. Wound up with seven DWIs in Texas that I know of. A lot of them didn't surface. I couldn't do now what I did then. You know what I'm saying? I couldn't do what I did then, today. I couldn't jump out of my car and run up and, you know, try to beat somebody's window down to, to kill them because they had cut me off at a light or done something like that. Uh, but anyway, that, that's, that's some of what I did. And we would have a fight, and then we'd separate, and then we'd get together, and we'd eventually there was uh, it was my son and then, then two daughters. And uh, anyway, the, the marriage dissolved, and uh, uh, I wound up in Texas County. And I met another little darling. Uh, she had had a nervous breakdown before I ever come along. Marguerite probably knows her mother. I ran into her at Bryce's cafeteria the other day. Bless her heart, real sweet mother-in-law. I met, the first night I met her, I said, don't worry about Pat, I'll take good care of her. Step, two steps back, fell right off the damn porch. <laughs> the first time I ever met her. Now, she had had a nervous breakdown before I ever came along. <laughs> and you know I didn't help matters. She had two boys and she had me. Oh, bless her heart. I hope she's doing well, you know. I, I know that I didn't bring any peace and happiness to her life. Uh, we, uh, I drank up a business down in Shreveport uh, during this time that I was exposed uh, to the AA. Uh, I was laying up Willis Knight in hospital one time. I had bleeding ulcers, and one of y'all came in and handed me a card, you know, a little card that uh, said, if you want to drink, that's your business. If you want to quit, it's ours. I said, you can keep your card. I'm just getting a little rest. You know, I wasn't ready. But I'll tell you, there are people in uh, very few left in Shreveport at the Highland Club that were there then, but those people were there for me. I made my first meeting from Shreveport over to Marshall, Texas with Monroe. Bless his heart. He's he's at the big meeting in the sky now. Monroe and Annette. And a, a lot of people, there's been a lot of people in my life that have, have been real good to me, that have loved me in spite of myself, and I I didn't appreciate it. I I was unconscious. I didn't know. And, uh, you know, that's, that's a little bit of what it was like. I, I've, I've, uh, done everything you can do. Uh, I, Kevin, I told him one time, I mentioned something, and, and I was in, I was in Dallas, and I had had me a handful of pocket rockets, and I was drinking wine, and there was another fellow there. Uh, well, you know, when you're drinking, you're lying. And all I really want you to do is shut up. So I can do my deal. Well, finally, it come around to me, and I, I told him, I said, I don't tell him. We're on a third-floor apartment in, in Dallas, skyline of Dallas, right there on Industrial Boulevard. And I said, I don't tell everybody this, but I fly a lot on weekends, and this is my time to fly. And there's three or four drunks around. Like, what the hell is he saying, you know? Well, I stagger to the bathroom, and I unhook a shower curtain, about the color of this shirt. I hook it around my neck, and I walk out there, and I hang a leg over the rail, and I'm listening to my cue. You know, I heard a couple of them say, he ain't going to jump, is he? But the, what I wanted to hear is, watch him jump. Well, I bailed off there like like Superman. I don't recommend that. Now, I missed the concrete by a couple inches and landed in the grass and crawled to the elevator. <laughs> Moaning and groaning and just crazy as a road lizard. And there's a guy, I remember, in that elevator, and he stepped back as I crawled aboard. And then he walked, worked his way around and boogied. And then I, now I had to have this story checked out. You know, I, I, I have trouble knowing when the truth and the lies are interwoven and what really happens. And, and there, there was some testimony that this did in fact happen. And I was sore. I was bad sore. But I used to, could, my deal was to stand up and free fall. I love to just stand up and fall flat on my face. And I knew how to do it where it didn't break my nose, head, or something. I love to do that. Weighed about 150. 
I don't know how I did it, and it don't matter, but people used to love for me to do it, and I love to do it. <laughs> and that flying sounded like a one hell of a deal if it had worked, you know. <laughs> but it didn't work, and, and a lot of crazy stuff. You know, the, the, the part that isn't funny, to wake up in a wet bed with your wife over there wondering, what is this fool, you know, how much of this crap can I stand? <laughs> on Linwood Avenue one time, right at Two Lane. They used to have some apartments there, and I lived there. And I was having a nightmare. I was a World War II fighter pilot ace. And I'm shooting them Germans down in the Luftwaffe like you're thinking about. And we had a swag lamp right over the bed that I didn't want to put up there to start with, okay? But I'm shooting this machine gun, man. <laughs> you know, I'm shooting these, these uh, Germans down left and right. My wife is over there having a fit, <laughs> like, what is he doing? And so vivid, when the swag lamp hit that headboard, and she screamed like a panther, I screamed like a panther, she grabbed me, and I swear this German Air Force pilot is in my lap, <laughs> and there's glass in the bed, and I'm jumping up, and I'm almost, you know, I had a good heart, and she did too. But I used to do stuff like on Linwood. The traffic's going down there, hauling it. And I would jump up and grab her ankle. She wasn't as big as nothing. I'd grab her ankle, pull her right out in the middle of the floor, and she'd wake up screaming, what are you doing? I said, hell, I'm saving your life, woman. The truck just come right down through here. <laughs> There's vivid. My, my deals were vivid. I used to believe that I had a beer, a six-pack of Pearl beer at Red Shoot, just out of Bossier City, every Thursday once a month with Smokey Bear. And if I had a drunk there listening to me, I, I could convince him we could drive out there. He was the guy starting all them forest fires out in Arizona. He had a big fuzzy pocket with a box of them used to be nickel matches down in there, and he would go running through the country just striking them in light. And the shortest way for him to go to his office in Washington would have been somewhere kind of like up I-40, I mean Interstate 40, but he would swing down to Shreveport and Bossier so he and I could drink some beer and raise some hell. I believe that crap. <laughs> now, you know something was wrong. My point is, I was very sick before I ever took a drink. I was never... <laughs> you know, I retired out of the Army in 1995, but I went to advanced NCO class at Fort Lee, Virginia, when I was 54 years old. And do you know, class of 38, I mean 38 people, for, for you senior citizens... <laughs> Do you know who was number 38? You're right. <laughs> I'm 54 years old and they damn near kill me. Some of them guys are 30 years old, get up 4 o'clock in the morning, go running down the road screaming like a panther. Midnight, you're reading and you're trying. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, and a lot of y'all do. But, but my point is, AA, sobriety, God in his infinite uh, mercy and wisdom has allowed me an opportunity to live. And... and uh, uh, that deal, as far as, as what happened and what it's like now, uh, when I when I threw up my hands in, in 1972 at the West End Group in Beaumont and made a phone call to my sister in Texarkana, and I told her to come get me and carry me to the nut house, and I didn't care what it was, Terrell Temple, up here at Benton, somewhere, there's, there's one down in Louisiana, it'd probably been real good for me, too. I didn't get there, but uh, uh, she didn't. She carried me home. She carried me to her home. She had a couple of young uh, boys. And her husband was an alcoholic, but I sobered up in Atlanta. I met Marguerite in, in Texarkana, is what I meant to say in Texarkana, and uh, Pat and, and people that aren't around. And y'all love me, and I, I haven't forgotten it. Whether I tell you that or not, I, I know I need to. But uh, uh, I, I had a job with Orkin Exterminating Company, and I came to El Dorado, Arkansas. It's about March of 73. And I met L.A. about that time. And I met Dorothy at the dormitory. I met a lot of y'all at that time. And I met a lot of people that aren't here anymore that uh, uh, shared with me and uh, uh, taught me how to live one day at a time. I learned what love meant in Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm not saying that I wasn't uh, loved by my parents. And I'm not saying I wasn't loved and taught and told. But I didn't feel it. You know, I feel it here. When John threw that torch or asked Clancy to... That's a heck of a lighter. To light that uh, candle a while ago, you know, there's love in this room. 
And I know what hate is. I don't want no more of that either. But there's a lot of love in this room. And I know, you know, it's been a while, uh, uh, since the 11th of September. You know, when we got up and turned on the TV that morning, you know, it will never be the same. And, and, and Alcoholics Anonymous, when I allowed you to teach me, uh, I'll never be the same. And I don't want to be the same. I don't ever want to be what, what I was. But I came here to this town and I was here a while and then I went to Pine Bluff a while and then, my sponsor, who is deceased, Marshall called me one day, and I was over at Dawes, and y'all know him. And he called me, and he said, do you want to go to the penitentiary? I said, hell no, I've stayed out this long, man. <laughs> he said, no, I mean, would you like to go to work, maybe, over at Parchman State Penitentiary? And I, I was less than two years sober. And those of you <laughs> with that, you know, that, that amount of time, a year or two, whatever, uh, we're not just real stable. We don't, we don't, <laughs> we'd get scorched in a fire drill, you know. Uh, but anyway, I, I went over there and, and Doyle and, 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 and Polly went with me and they kind of, kind of, uh, talked to Bill Gocher. Six, seven implement salesman from Clarksdale, Mississippi, and he would, uh, slap that uh, ashtray and he said, we're going to rebutate these bastards. <laughs> I said, whoa, yeah, we're going to read potato. <laughs> About nine months of that, and I couldn't even talk. I, I apologize for cussing. I, anybody I offend, I'm sorry. I'm doing about as good as I can on that. I've cleaned it up a lot. I, I've cleaned it up a lot. I go to church a little, uh, about 40 or 50 place. Uh, uh, I was baptized in this church in 1949, and then I come back when I was <laughs> 59, you know, or... Fifty years later, I showed up. Uh, anyway, uh, I, I'm, try, I'm trying to work on that, too. I know I don't shouldn't have to cuss to stress a point, but I, I, I guess I enjoy it a lot. But uh, uh, um, Anyway, I went over there and I worked. I, on my second uh, uh, sober uh, birthday, I went to work at Parchment. And I was there nine months, and then I couldn't deal with that. And I, well, I mean, you know, I, I came back here, and I worked at South Arkansas Regional Health Center. And... Uh, while I was in Mississippi, I went down one day to watch the guys drill at the National Guard. Uh, and before the day is over, here I am, man. I'm, I'm back in the, in the deal. I'm 38 years old. Thought I was, didn't, couldn't imagine being in the Army ever. And here I am. I'm, I'm accepted. They was in need of people, I guess. And anyway, I made a annual training up at Camp Shelby, and then I moved back here and got in the Army Reserve. And anyway, what that eventually did is, uh, uh, it, I went back active duty at uh, 48 years old here at the Reserve Center here in El Dorado. As a matter of fact, we're going to have a reunion in two weeks right here at this facility of uh, the 10th anniversary of Desert Storm and then a, 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 a anniversary of, of the alumni of that Reserve Center. But, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm a felon, man. You, you, don't, you don't get DWIs all over the country and then... Uh, uh, be able to uh, join the military. I don't guess, but it did. Got a card in my pocket. Uh, they retired me in uh, 1995, and that's good. But but all this is a miracle. You know, I worked real hard to destroy everything that I touched and everybody and uh, and on and on and on, but I didn't. But this fellowship, Fellowship Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, I drank up two women. I drank up a lot of people. I disappointed a lot of people. I didn't know how to be a husband. I didn't know how to be a father. And I didn't know how to be an employee. And I didn't know how to do anything. But if you want to lie and steal and cheat, I know how. I did it. I'm not proud of it. You know, I heard, I heard, I read in a, in a little Sunday school book here a while back, a little prayer. I love it. God, your will. Nothing more, nothing less. Nothing else. Amen. That's kind of where I am right now. You know, nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. I don't need any more than God's will. I know that. Now, if you'd have thrown a lot of God at me early on at these programs, I'd have broken and run. I, I, I'd, have, I'd have had a lot of trouble with that. Man in the meeting last night, <laughs> that, that deal he was talking about, I hope, <laughs> he, was, he was telling the woman that invited him to go to a meeting for an hour. Well, I hope they don't talk in them unknown tongues and dance around and roll around in the floor. And you know what? What he? I knew what he meant. I couldn't handle that. I know it, the motive was good and it, it's it's good and all that. But I, you gotta. 
I had to be handled very gently when in that in that regard because God had punishing. It was hellfire and brimstone. And I thought for a lot of years I was illegitimate anyway, and I played the part. I did. I act like I, I felt like a illegitimate child at a family reunion when I awoke every day. Wasn't true, but I felt like it and I acted like it and all that. I went one time to ask a guy about that. Just <laughs> as a matter of fact, until I did that, I didn't sober up. But I had to, I had to clean away some wreckage of the past before I could uh, uh, do anything at all about or ever having any kind of a future. Uh, I tell you what it's like right now. Like I said earlier, uh, 29th of June, Sue and I, my redheaded nurse wife, stepped off the airplane in uh, uh, Anchorage and Fairbanks, Alaska, and she she had a 13 week uh, job up there, and. Uh, I went along to play. And Fairbanks, you can go to meetings at noon and 5 and 8 p.m., seven days a week. Sunday morning you can go. I was two miles from uh, meetings. I bought me a bicycle. I'm going to ride a bicycle and get in shape and all that kind of stuff. That didn't last long. <laughs> I gave it I gave it to an AA member the other day. The fact is I went out to pay for my car rental one day, and they put me to work. And I thought, man, I can't work and ride a bicycle. <laughs> I guess I could have, but I didn't. I didn't want to. Anyway, I gave him a bicycle to a good AA member. He's riding it, and taking good care of it. Hope he's healthy. You know, I smoked three packs of cigarettes a day for 38 years. Smoked like I was on commission. Drank like I was on commission. Self-destruct. You know, I was thinking yesterday. I don't know why. I used to sit. Well, I was. I, this little job I had was detailing washing cars. You know, how do you how do you make that fancy? You wash your car, right? I did that when I was 15 years old, Vic Motor Company, Atlanta, Texas. I'm 65. I was up there washing cars, full circle, happy as a mule eating briars. <laughs> My wife making $28 an hour, and I'm making eight. <laughs> now it ta- it takes it to live up there. I tell you, there's some little surprises though. There's a flip side to everything. When I paid $325 to fly from uh, Fairbanks to Seattle. That wasn't bad. They had me a standby ticket, and I'm standing there, and they said, it'll cost you $1,070 to go to Dallas. I said, whoa. But I bought me a ticket. I wanted to come home. And I was able to. I didn't have to lie still to beat anybody out of that. That was, oh, God takes real good care of me. Pray for taters get a hoe. Do something different. You know, if you're out there and you have a sponsor, he or she's going to ask you to do some stuff you don't want to do. And if you want to do them, something's wrong. <laughs> Matter of fact, if you don't want to do them, something's probably right. Pray for taters, get a hold, do something different. I know this, when a person in Alcoholics Anonymous walks up to a man and hugs his neck, I didn't, I didn't know how to hug anybody's neck. I knew what lust and greed and self-will meant. But in Alcoholics Anonymous, when a man walks up and looks at me and tells me he loves me, I feel it. And when I walk up and hug your neck and tell you I love you, I mean it. And you can see it in here. And I feel it in here. And that's a real good deal. I tell you, I hope you're not here tonight and come in and judge Alcoholics Anonymous by me. I am not a spokesman for the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. Like, like my friend L.A. says, he says, this ain't A.A., this is L.A. <laughs> well, if it ain't in the big book, it's probably a bunch of crap anyway. You know, we all got a belly button. We all got an opinion. You know, everybody's got one, and that that's okay. But uh, it was red up here. If you want to know how this program works, there's a deal. It'll, it'll run you up the wall hearing it, how it works. Rarely have we seen a person fail. It could say, rarely have we seen a person follow our path. It could say it just as well. I'll, I wouldn't even make a guess. You know, if the people in El Dorado, Arkansas, or Mena, Arkansas, or Atlanta, Texas, or whatever, were here that needed to be it, here, meaning whatever town that is, that needed to be here, there ain't enough room. The people that are here are the people that want to be here. Now, there may be some people here to get your deal signed. There may be some people here in treatment. And, and that's okay. I mean, everybody's got to do what you got to do. I think if you're here, please don't prejudge it, though. There's been people that's come to Alcoholics Anonymous and said, I don't need any of that crap and leave and die. You don't have to do it. You really don't have to do it. Uh, no, my wife, I, I, I love my wife. 
We learned how to live together. I was talking earlier to Todd. We paid the price to stay together. I don't want anybody to think this is all tippy-toe happy stuff. Every once in a while, we have to get toe-to-toe. I told her right here, I was going to, uh, uh, well, she was over at County. She was director of alcohol and drug program over there. And I told her I was in the Army, and the Army sent me north. I said, I got to go. I'm in the Army. You ain't got to do a damn thing. <laughs> well, she said, that's right. <laughs> I went north, and a year later, she came on up there. But it took what it took. Hey, man, you know, it's okay. It's okay to... To, to disagree. It's okay to have an argument. It's okay to love somebody and not like them. You know, i got a daughter in Marshall, Texas. I love her, but I don't like her right now. She don't like me either. She's a lot like me. That's a problem. She is too much like me. And I've told her that. It'll, it'll, it'll cause her problem. Uh, I know this. Uh, I... Uh, I had diphtheria when I was an infant, and I didn't die. And I've had a couple of communicable deals, and I didn't die. And I had a heart attack, and I didn't die. And I got alcoholism, and I'm not dead. And I'm grateful for that. You know, I, I saw a fellow from, from Louisiana a while ago, and, and I don't know. You know, I'm getting real emotional in my older years. I, sometimes I can see somebody, and I, I'm so thrilled to see them, I just have a tear. And it doesn't embarrass me. I guess I guess I'm feeling what we're supposed to feel, and it's so strange because uh, a lot of us just didn't hardly get a chance to feel it, you know. And when you do, when we feel love, and when we care for another human being, and and we're we're able to accept love, uh, you know, Jean back there, bless her heart, <laughs> and and, uh, and and Robin sitting next. To that's two people that I, I I hadn't heard them say anything bad about anybody. I told them, y'all just keep doing what you're doing. I'll take care of it for you. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't well yet. I, I don't expect to be. Uh, I know this. I'm uh, I'm about to run out of gas, and I'll tell you what's real painful. Is for you to sit out there and listen to me ad lib for another ten minutes. <laughs> it's painful for you, but it ain't. It's real painful for me too. You know, I don't. Uh, I don't relish being up here at this podium to start with. I love to be out there, and I love the fellowship, and I love what uh, what you give me. But I, again, if, if you're if you're here and you're new and you're confused and you and you don't know what to do then I I relate to that I come into this little town not not little town <laughs> I come from a little town of, of Atlanta and in Texas County here and I got me a little place up by the bus station one little room and I went to AA meetings and I went out to the dormitory and I one time I heard Dorothy and Bob Dorothy is her. She wanted me to tell everybody hello, and she loves you, and she wished she could be here. She can't be. And Bob F. They were playing cards, and they were they were, they were laughing. And here I am, thirty six years old, sitting there watching them be stupid and have fun, and I got to laughing. And I laughed from about three o'clock on a Sunday afternoon until about ten on a Sunday night. And just watching them and just, just mellowing out and just loving. I wasn't afraid and I felt like I was where I was supposed to be and, and, uh, I think there was some food there and, and I didn't want to leave there. I did not want to go to that room and deal with this. And finally Dorothy come over and put her arm around me. She said, Maurice, you can come back in the morning. And man. That may sound pretty simple to you. But I went out in that car, and I, I drove to that room, and I probably prayed. I don't know that I really knew how, but I, I wanted to feel different. Uh, and then I came back the next day, and that was probably on a Sunday. And then I kept going to meetings. And uh, Billy P., he's here tonight. I've ridden up and down the road with him to, to Louisiana 
uh, I don't know where all we've been, Greenville, Mississippi, Little Rock, on and on and on. And, uh, and, and I started, I started getting better. And then, then I moved over to a little duplex by the ice house. And then Jean, she made a phone call and got me a room. I'm talking about on, with white carpet up on Jefferson Boulevard, some judge's home. And I mean, I walked in there and I thought, whoa, this ain't, you know, I still smoke like a train. And I thought, I, I don't deserve this. And I didn't. And my point in this is a day at a time and over a reasonable period of time, I got a little better. And my economical situation got a little better. And I was able to make amends and I was able to, to, to do some things different. And, and my life has gotten, you know, just good, very good. Uh, what it's like, you know, I've, I've got, uh, I have. God has allowed Sue and I to have 10 acres on the Washtenaw River in Maine, Arkansas. My mother passed away a couple of years ago. We're working, uh, uh, she's working some, she'll, she'll be working where my daughter is in, uh, in a little clinic in Atlanta when she gets back. And, uh, I'm going to that little church and I, I on Sunday morning, I'm up there when the, when, you know, when the communion goes around. And I'm there with some, some heroes, some military people. And when I stand up, you know, I know we're all patriotic now. And I tell you what, I get real tearful when, when the flag comes by. But, and and and, it, and and I appreciate what you said, partner. Uh, I, my my heart and my hat goes out to you. Uh, but my life is is good. It's it's great. I got five dogs, two cats. I got a red-headed wife. I got a daughter right out here that, that we're trying to learn to know one another. She's got a, a, a grown son and, and a couple of uh, daughters. You know, a teenage daughter and a little. Two-year-old who I babysitted with a couple of days uh, this week. Uh, I wouldn't trade places with anybody. Uh, and, and Alcoholics Anonymous is what did it. I don't, you know, I know you've heard this, but if you're new and you're here, you make a list of what you want. You just write on a, on a scribble it on a piece of paper what you want, and in about a year, look at it. You will have surpassed that. I'm talking about something within reason. And you could add 20 more things to it. And in five years, 10, 20. You know, the, the person that got up first today has the most sobriety. 29 years, one day at a time, come one day at a time. And there will be tragedies that will come. My mother and dad died since I've been in here. My father-in-law and my mother-in-law died. A lot of friends in this fellowship have. Uh... It, it's, I, you know, I don't have words to express what uh, Alcoholics Anonymous has done to me. I didn't think I'd live long enough to have three friends, friends like this right here, this close. God's been real good. A friend of mine in Mina, who's very, his health is real bad. Uh, I didn't expect to come back and see him when I come back from Alaska. Ben C. down at Farmerville, I didn't get to see him again. I did see him before I left, but... Uh, I, this guy says, uh, uh, I call my higher power God because that's his real name. <laughs> you ever heard one better than that? I tell you, if, if, if the God thing runs you off, don't run off too far. Just kind of ease back here in the back and get over in the corner. It'll be all right a little later. And I'm not, you know, I'm not a, uh, trying to recruit anybody uh, to church, but I, but I, the, the the spirituality and a higher power, I, I don't know. I just don't know how people can make it without one. But uh, I'm going to show you all a little mercy and, and turn four or five minutes back over to the chair. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.